I don't think I ever packed in more into one year than um, 1982 when I became the editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. And that story is what I'd like to talk about, at least in part, in this uh, fourth uh, narration of the um, oral history series uh, recorded on July 24th, 2015. I hadn't had a a very uh, successful uh, time in Chicago. I thought I was going to be um, kept on as an editor at the Journal of the American Medical Association after I'd served my Fishbein Fellowship there and really enjoyed that. And I was at Lutheran General Hospital as a faculty member in family medicine and struggling both logistically because it was 20 miles uh, into a commute and out in Park Ridge, Illinois, and uh, I was not familiar with roads or traffic and uh, really was a part of my caranoia that uh, made me detest having to drive out there all the time. And I'd gotten that job uh, because I, while at the Journal of the American Medical Association, I was invited to give a grand rounds on the tobacco issue. And um, working at the AMA downtown, I hailed a cab and gave them the address on um, Lutheran of Lutheran General Hospital, Park Ridge, and next thing we know, I had never been there, and we were driving up Lakeshore Boulevard, which is right along Lake Michigan, and I'm thinking, I knew that this is inland, uh, but uh, this is well before we had GPS systems. The driver wasn't an English-speaking person. And all I can say is we went to, um, you know, from New York to Boston by way of Los Angeles, and um, it... it uh, it was so nerve-wracking because I think I went out of the office at about a quarter to ten, figuring this is going to take about 20, 25 minutes, and I would have time to sit up. Uh, I did not uh, arrive at Lutheran General Hospital till 11.20 for my 11 o'clock grand rounds. And there was an entire audium filled, and you could even hear the sound as I came running in. And I was greeted by um, my host, and they were at least glad I got there, and I slammed the slides on the carousel. It, it, it calmed down, and it turned out to be um, one of the better talks I've ever given, and the um, audience was very responsive, um, at least 100, 150 uh, physicians and nurses, and uh, so all's well that ends well, and as I was walking out, uh, I a, a fellow was standing there and looking rather perturbed, and I had uh, taken quite a few pot shots at hospital directors for not having gotten involved in the smoking issue, smoking was still permitted everywhere, including everywhere in a hospital. And um, as I was leaving, this gentleman said to me, uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm uh, George Caldwell, the president of this hospital. And I said, oh, 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 uh, Mr. Caldwell, oh, nice to meet you. Well, you know, I, um, in fairness, I, 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 I do appreciate your, your having in, uh, hosted my talk. And uh, I'm sorry I had to say those things about hospital directors. Uh, but he said, oh, no, no. You're absolutely right. And in fact, I was so um, moved by your talk that I want, I want to show you something. And, um, and he walked me over to a brand new audiovisual facility with a TV studio and uh, uh, all sorts of the latest equipment. And it was a $1 million uh, uh, building that had been donated by the deaconesses at Lutheran General Hospital. And he said, I just want you to know this is uh, yours. Anytime you need any slides, you want to make posters, you want to do a, record a TV um, tape, uh, it's all yours. You just give me a ring and I'll arrange for you to do this carte blanche anytime you want. Any equipment you need, any slides you want, any films, this is yours. I was so thrilled uh, and I thanked him profusely and he said, and by the way, um, how would you like to come out and work for Lutheran General when you're finished with your fellowship? And <laughs> I, I didn't really take him seriously, and I forgot about it. And then uh, a few months later, as I was finishing the fellowship and thought I was going to be remaining on at JAMA, but I, I was not uh, kept there, um, I got a call from him, and he invited me to uh, come and work at Lutheran General Hospital. I would have a faculty position in family medicine in the residency program, and I would also work for something called... Um, uh, Lutheran Environmental Services, 
and or I'm trying to think what the name was, but in any one, it was an alcohol rehabilitation center or human ecological services, I think it was. And I would be splitting my time there, and I would be able to continue with the activism on tobacco by producing a lot of slides and films. And um, in any event, um, this this had a limited half-life because I was split between these two locations. Whenever I was supposed to be in the family practice center, someone thought, I turns out I was scheduled to be in the human ecology area. And uh, so after about a year and a half uh, I, or, or less, I was not renewed. And here I was floundering once again and happened to open up a New England Journal of Medicine. And there was a classified ad for an editor and deputy editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. And I thought this was incredible. If, if I didn't uh, get the editorship, perhaps I could win the deputy editorship. And I fired off a letter and my CV and made prominent mention that I had been a fellow in medical journalism at uh, JAMA. And uh, I heard back uh, within about a week. And uh, a call from the, uh, I think they call themselves the Deputy General or the Secretary General of the Australian Medical Association asking me if I would be interested in flying to New York the following week when he and another member of the publishing board of the Medical Journal of Australia would be traveling and they would be happy to interview me in New York. And I did fly to New York and met them in the Algonquin Hotel. Very nice, cordial get-together uh, between George Reppin uh, who was the Secretary General of the Australian Medical Association, and uh, a fellow named Richard Walsh, who had been a kind of a, a boy wonder and a troublemaker in the magazine field and had been a physician but uh, started a, a, a rather irreverent magazine, I think it was called Oz, that got him into some trouble with censors, and he became well-known and pushing the edge, and he was named a member of this uh, publishing company. He also was the head of the Kerry Packer publishing empire in Australia, which was the first or second largest publishing empire in Australia. A rather powerful fellow in the book business, and he was coming along with Reppin from the Frankfurt Book Fair. And we had this interview, and a week later, after I flew back to Chicago, I received a call. And I remember being alone in the apartment and answering the phone and hearing, uh, Hello, is this uh, Dr. Bloom? And I said, yes. He said, well, this is uh, Sir Keith Jones here in, in Australia. And I uh, wonder whether, dear boy, you'd be interested in serving as the editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. And I, I almost dropped the phone. I couldn't believe it. I, well, yes, sir. Yes. I, I didn't know how to refer to a sir. I, I didn't know that it's actually Sir Keith. But I said, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, Dr. Jones or whatever. I didn't know he was a physician. But um, uh, we... Um, worked it out, and he said he'd be calling me with some salary details, and uh, that was that. I quickly called up my wife, Doris, and who was in Savannah, and I said, looks like um, if you'd like to, we could go to Australia, and she accepted that, and we moved 10,000 miles away. It was minus, I think, minus 20 in Chicago the day we left with uh, 18-month-old uh, son Leon in tow, and it was something along the lines of 95 degrees in the mid summer of Sydney, Australia, when we landed, picked up by George Reppin and driven to our a residence, which was a fifth floor, one room, not one bedroom, one room apartment in one of the least desirable uh, districts in Sydney. There were 484 districts. Um, Mechanicville, I believe, was number 484, and that bordered on Newtown, which was where we were. I think ours was ranked in the 470s. It was largely an immigrant community. But because it was close to Glebe, another very low-rent uh, area, but an area that the publishing company was situated in, and I could theoretically walk across the campus of the University of Sydney to reach Glebe and the offices, uh, that was how it was decided that we would live there. Um, generally, when you move to Australia, the, the company that moves you gives you a rather nice residence and a car um, for at least three months. This is part of the contract. And all I can say is this was nickel and diming uh, like I'd never seen because uh, although we did have air conditioning, um, we had one bed, and that was a bed that came down from the wall, and they had installed a crib which took up half the one room, and we didn't even have a child who slept in a crib. He slept with us. So it, it was 
utterly unbelievable to to land from a beautiful apartment in Chicago to this awful one room shag carpeted um, dismal uh, apartment in Sydney. But nonetheless, um, I persevered um, at least for a time. We didn't even have a telephone, and it takes a while to get a telephone. And um, that first week after the traumatic uh, flights over for a, a, a young child, our boy started to wheeze and to make some terrible breathing sounds, and it turns out that he had the croup. We had to walk about a mile and a half to the Royal Princess Alexandra Hospital, where Leon was admitted, and they told us, okay, now we'll take care of him, and they basically bid uh, us goodbye. And now, not having a phone and not used to hospitals that kick parents out, uh, Doris and I insisted, and they finally relented, and she was able to stay with him in the hospital, but I had no way to communicate with her. I think that first night we did not stay with him, but after that we made sure that we did. And um, it was pretty much the way things worked in Australia. Uh, they were still selling cigarettes, by the way, in the canteen in the Royal Alexandra uh, Hospital. Um, the um, uh, One of my close friends became the janitor of the uh, medical journal. Um, he uh, was just a wonderful person, and Alan was his name, and he would uh, listen closely to what else was going on in the building, and he would let me know. Uh, and I'll, I'll relate more about that. But um, uh, I had never thought to ask how they, it happened that they needed both an editor and a deputy editor of the medical journal. And, of course, no sooner did I get there that I learned that the previous editor and her deputy editor had walked out over interference by the publishing company, which was a, an established corporation that was slightly separated from the Australian Medical Association, but which was really sort of mixed in with it in the same building. And um, they were infuriated that a business manager, I think called a publisher, had been hired who, from the moment he took over, was uh, uh, on uh, supervising them. So thus the medical people were subservient to the business people. And that was the, the, the model that was coming into play at that time. And um, they did not tolerate that, and they walked. Sir Keith took over as interim editor. But when I arrived, I saw manuscripts that I really felt were of totally unacceptable quality that were sitting there ready to be printed. Uh, a skeletal staff was there. They were carting out the library, which I find essential to a medical journal to verify references and things. In that time, we had no computers, uh, so there was no such thing as a computerized medical journal. And um, journals, back copies of both our own journal and other volumes were essential to peer review and assigning authors and finding out who else had written on that topic. But uh, I think that the, the whole experience could be typified by one morning a couple of months after I was in office, and I would be coming in around 9 to 9.30 because I did not want to... Uh, well, I, I, when I first got there, I was coming in earlier because I could walk there. But when we finally moved over to a place called Bondi Junction, and I was given a car and was able to drive, usually on the correct side of the street, uh, I would avoid rush hour, and I would... Um, um, uh, pass by the train station and pick up all of the day's newspapers from all over Australia and come in and spend the first half hour scanning them and looking for medical stories. I had a wonderful staff, a secretary who had been there many years, um, uh, Katrina Norton, and uh, she was marvelous. Um, and um, But she soon saw the, the frustrations I was having and the interference by the publishing company, and she basically said she was going to uh, to leave. And uh, we then had a wonderful secretary, uh, Fran, uh, who uh, succeeded her. And uh, these were really the highlights of, of my time there because we had a terrific staff. Now, the first week or two I was there, I don't think I impressed the staff because I never came out of the office. I worked very hard trying to get issues out. They were published every other week. And um, I, I finally was approached by one of the staff members to say that, you know, it is traditional to have tea in the morning, and tea time was at 10.30, where they rolled out the tea trolley, and also in the afternoon. And so I quickly realized I better join the uh, the tea break, and, and I think morale increased right after that. Uh, but I was sitting at the office and um, got a call 
uh, from someone who said, uh, hello, I'd like to speak to the editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. And I said, uh, well, this is he. And he said, yes, please, I'd like to, uh, issue, I'd like to submit a manuscript uh, on the Anzacs in the hospitals in Malta. A- and I just, I, I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, I, like any editor would say, I said, well, w- why don't you send it in? Oh, but, uh, uh, yes, but I would like to know whether, uh, first of all, I asked him to repeat it. And he said, it was the, the Anzacs in the hospitals in Malta. And I still had no idea what he was saying. And I said, oh, just send it in. He says, yes, but I would like to know whether it would be published before Anzac Day. Now, by this point, I had no idea what he was talking about. And um, I, um, I, I said, I'm so sorry. I don't understand what you're saying. And he says, yes, uh, I, 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 I would like, please, to speak to the editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. And so this was a total uh, a, a, a disaster of a conversation. I explained I didn't know what Anzac Day was. And he explained that this was basically the Australian national holiday, the equivalent of July 4th. And it was when the day that the... A uh, country was united through the terrible defeat at Gallipoli in World War I uh, that had taken a country that had had separate states and state governments and different railroads with different gauges and really made it a united country. And so um, that was typical of the kinds of, of uh, uh, weaning that I had to have to learn about the customs, to learn cricket, to learn um, the, the mores of a totally different country. Uh, another story was that I was sitting at my desk and um, uh, was asked, I was called and invited to be the centenary speaker uh, on the anniversary of the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. Uh, now, I, I didn't know about the hospital. I didn't know anything about Melbourne. I hadn't been there yet. But this particular hospital was reaching its centennial, and they needed a, a speaker. It was going to be a lavish affair. And I figured this was a good way to, to get to know uh, people in Melbourne, and that was great, and I accepted. Of course, when I got there, I, I knew no one, and I, I the only thing I really could speak on at that time was about the tobacco issue, and I um, could I n- have no idea why they wanted me to, to give this talk, and I, I happened to say, as I realized this was getting into names and people and history that I had no knowledge of as much as I had tried to learn a bit of it, and I finally turned to my host and I said, I, I, I guess I wasn't the first person you invited to speak as the, your guest speaker. And he said, oh, no. Oh, no, not at all. And I, I said, could you tell me more? And he said, oh, well, first we, we looked for the head of the Royal Ballet Company of Australia, and he was busy. And, and then we asked her so-and-so, so-and-so, the head of the opera company, and he was busy. And we tried uh, various uh, other celebrities in Melbourne and Sydney and actors and writers and authors and, and uh, newspaper editors. And finally, somebody said, why don't we just get the editor of the old Medical Journal of Australia, whoever he is. And um, it, it went over well, though. I, I, they, they appreciated my talk, of course, as I stood up to talk about uh, the physician's role in ending the tobacco pandemic, who should be sitting right in front of me, and I recognized him by his photograph, was the physician... Uh, who was the head medical advisor to the Australian Tobacco Research Council, funded entirely by the tobacco industry. Uh, A great trip. I think I made a good impression. I never uh, had any further words with him. We shook hands afterwards and uh, were very cordial to one another. And uh, I heard he was not particularly a, a pleasant individual to deal with. But this is a person who had taken sides with the tobacco industry in the early 1980s to say we still needed more research. We really didn't have the proof that showed that smoking caused all those diseases. And smoking did become my cause celebre as editor. We uh, uh, produced uh, uh, the most controversial cover, perhaps, in the history of that journal. It it featured a cover of uh, a poster uh, of a group called Bugger Up, Billboard Utilizing Graffitist Against Unhealthy Promotions. And... um, uh, this was a, a marvelous uh, group of a- anonymous individuals who by night and sometimes by day would go and reface cigarette billboards uh, and also alcohol billboards. There was a famous slogan of one brand of beer called KB, and the slogan was shake hands with a KB. And, um, the, uh, of course, Bugger Up would, would go up by night and they would repaint the ad to say shaky hands with KB. Um, there was another brand called, uh, I forget the name of the brand, but the slogan was the Silver Bullet. And they would reface that and change it to the Liver Bullet. 
the cigarette advertising was their specialty. Benson and Hedges became Benson and Stenches, and all sorts of speech bubbles were posted on the ads if ever there was a person in the ad. And uh, they were really hilarious. Um, the most famous ad that they did, knowing that around Christmas time there would be nobody working because there were these great holidays in Australia and many strikes. And um, the most famous strike, of course, was the uh, workers in downtown Sydney constructing a bil- building who were uh, so um, uh, taken by the aromas of the Chinese restaurants near where they were that they struck uh, in order to have catered Chinese lunches. The um, But uh, knowing that there would be nobody up uh, on on doing new billboards and during the Christmas season, which extended at least 10 days, the bugger up people went to the largest billboard and the tallest because it was on top of a building, Marlboro sign, in probably in the whole country. And it just was a huge ad that said Marlboro, and it had a Marlboro man on it. And um, they, they, they changed the lettering from Marlboro to It's a Bore. And so you'd wake up in the morning on the way to work, and you'd see throughout half of Sydney, you'd see this big billboard saying, it's a bore. And um, they became quite uh, famous, notorious. And um, one other event was uh, when Philip Morris announced its Australian Marlboro Man contest. Uh, Someone they were looking for who would epitomize the manliness and character of the Marlboro brand. Bugger Up uh, found a fellow in a nursing home who was breathing uh, with an oxygen tank through his tracheostomy tube. Um, uh, that's a hole in the neck. And so they, they were able to, to convince him to pose in his wheelchair. Um, I think he had one leg, too, from vascular disease, um, holding up his Marlboro. And with the red uh, hole, they, they colored uh, the red hole of his tracheostomy, um, and they they reframed a a Marlboro ad, and they which had the twenty five thousand dollar reward for the uh, Marlboro Marlboro Man of Australia. They said, um, "This showing the picture of this gentleman. This is Fred H of Darlinghurst. Uh, Fred is Bugger Up's entrant in the Marlboro Man of uh, Australia competition. Um, due to an operation, a tracheostomy." He now smokes through a hole in his neck. Frank is Bugger Up's entrant in the $25,000 Philip Morris's Marlboro Man competition, someone they describe as having a strong and distinctly individual masculinity, that unique difference that personifies the flavor of Marlboro. Do you think Frank will win? And they created tens of thousands of posters and these hoardings, as they're called in Australia, are everywhere. Everywhere there's a blank wall uh, that you'll see a poster for a theater or a rock concert. And sure enough, one morning, everybody awoke to see the $25,000 reward for the Marble Row Man of Australia, Fred H. of Darlinghurst. And the poster made the front page of all the newspapers, and I took it uh, and put it on the cover of the Medical Journal of Australia. And just before it was to go to press, out of the blue, I received a letter from a law firm. The law firm uh, insisted that uh, we cease and desist, that we not publish this defamatory advertisement. And the law firm's name was, representing Philip Morris, Sly and Russell. We did go ahead and and publish uh, the cover, which then made even more news, and nothing ever happened by way of Philip Morris in terms of any litigation. However, that was t- the kind of, of, of hilarity, but also the kind of tension that began. And the publishing uh, uh, company uh, chairman, Dr. Lindsay Thompson, had taken over in a coup when I arrived, uh, shortly before I arrived, from Sir Keith Jones. And in fact, when they announced a day or so after I got there that I had a meeting with the chairman, I was so excited because I was going to be meeting Sir Keith Jones. And I was in my Sunday best, and I went down to the offices and was ushered into the room, and there was a strange character with a rather callow look. Um, didn't look healthy. It had a kind of a, uh, there's a condition called Addison's disease. In any event, uh, 
and it was hello dear boy uh this is lindsay thompson it was it was a kind of a growly very put on uh british accent and uh this i realized was going to be trouble uh he was also the president of the australian medical association and had engineered a coup to take over the publishing company at the same time and uh, from the moment we met uh, we had an instant dislike for one another uh he uh insisted that we hire a deputy editor of a list that he had already compiled uh many of whom were associated with the pharmaceutical industry and he also um one time came by stealth of night whether through personal intervention or through uh, one of the uh, publishing managers that uh, were ne- then working for the company and pulled one of my editorials off of the bulletin board that was going to be run uh, that was uh critical of the cigarette companies uh I, and also of the advertising agencies that did cigarette advertising and then there was also the issue of pharmaceutical advertising i made it very clear from my first day that no longer would editorial content be given in advance to pharmaceutical advertisers this had been a, a tried and true way to attract pharmaceutical advertising if the advertisers knew when an article on a certain subject particularly a certain medication would be running uh the uh, uh the ad agency for a, a pharmaceutical company would be more likely to place an ad for that drug in that same issue and i think that was entirely unethical so um i did uh, gather together a whole lot of um, old antibiotic advertisements that had appeared in that journal uh claims for penicillin chewing gum all sorts of antibiotics that had advertised uh no resistant strains uh and of course the big issue in that era of 1982 was the emergence of what was called methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus so the topic of antibiotic resistance was front page news literally and we prepared an issue that was in progress before i got there a theme issue on uh methicillin resistant staph aureus and in researching that i had gone back to the 50s in australia when there had also been um concerns about staphylococcal infections and other infections and there had been various bacterial scares over the years and so i create i wrote a very small very brief editorial uh, called the fleeting hopes and promises of advertising and and simply talked about the history of antibiotic advertising as something that we were entirely wrong to have permitted by allowing these advertisements to appear with promises of no resistance we help create uh, over uh, prescribing of antibiotics well no sooner did the editorial appear than uh, i received uh, a, a notice that the uh, the pharmaceutical council was very displeased and i would be barred from attending the pharmaceutical council which was the meeting once a month between the editors of the country's medical journals and uh, the pharmaceutical advertisers uh and that they thought would upset me but all that was was a lavish lunch at the finest restaurants in sydney but uh given the this uh obvious rift with um Lindsay Thompson and the growing tension i um i was either going to resign because at that time i had already heard from the new york state journal of medicine they were looking for an editor and my wife wanted to head back to the united states anyway she was tired of this uh kind of sheila mentality uh, she'd get on a bus with a stroller and no one would help her uh bus doors would close in her face she wasn't having a good time in a fairly low rent district while i was at least intellectually stimulated in running a journal for 8 10 12 hours a day and so um i um i sought to either resign or to say either i have independence or i will leave and at that time they were so surprised that they did um let me write an editorial uh, talking about uh, the subject of pharmaceutical advertising and uh it was rather a clear-cut statement that these were not to influence us in any way and i think it was quite a setback for the pharmaceutical industry i have no doubt that the publishing manager continued to provide the editorial content to the advertisers but at least the policy was not to do so i was also approached by um a supplement manu- a su- uh, by uh, um the uh a, one company that wanted to produce uh, a supplement in the journal that uh, they claimed would be peer reviewed uh and would give the journal an additional a, a bolus of funding um knowing of course that these supplements meant that that would have pharmaceutical underwriting i said well this would be fine but of course we will do the peer review not you 
And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. We'll have the best peer reviewers in the world, and we'll have the fine, we'll, we will make sure this is peer reviewed. But of course, his peer reviewed were all the scientists that worked for the company. So um, it was explained to me that the supplements were very important for the pharmaceutical industry to have on the desks of members of parliament. So it was, it was in their self-interest to have this. I had nothing, I would, would have nothing of it, and I declined to have uh, these supplements and thus cost the um, medical journal considerable revenue. This uh, did not endear me to them, and uh, tensions uh, I- uh, increased. Uh, there was also the matter of the hiring of deputy editor, and by this point I had interviewed quite a few people, none of whom had impressed me that they had provided. I did like one fellow from England, a fellow named Richard Barling, um, uh, who uh, would, was considering moving all the way from England to Australia. But it didn't work out. I, I found a remarkable young lady who had not practiced medicine, but she was a microbiologist, and I thought she was excellent. The board resisted, but I insisted, and we hired Dr. Kathy King. And uh, she handled a lot of the peer review while I did a lot of the traveling to try to increase uh, support for the medical journal. You know, a, a second- or third-line journal like the Medical Journal of Australia had a very hard time attracting uh, even Australian authors, because a lot of the good stuff would go to the Lancet or the British Medical Journal. So I worked very, very hard to convince them to give us a try. And I think to a lot, large extent I succeeded. We increased the readership. We increased the letters to the editor. We certainly increased the attention the journal got in the news media. And um, it was all in all a very uh, important year for me. I, I enjoyed it, but it was a year of turmoil. And uh, finally, when I was... Uh, asked to um, edit the Australian Prescriber, which was an independent evaluator of drugs patterned along the lines of the, um, the Australian Prescriber published by the Commonwealth Government. I thought this was uh, heresy because this, was, this would mean putting uh, an independent uh, evaluator of drugs amidst uh, a journal, ours, that had, a journal, had many pharmaceutical ads in each issue. This would not have been ethical or right, but it all came to a head when the board meeting, um, this was put on the table, and I was told that this was my option, uh, that I had to edit this. I, I pointed out that there was nowhere in my contract that I was told I would be editing a second journal. And if I uh, did have to do this, I would uh, no doubt resign. And that's where we left it. Uh, and uh, I had been tipped off to this meeting by the, the janitor, the custodian, Alan Bray, who came to me and closed the door and said, Doctor. Doctor, I got to tell you something, Doctor. I was cleaning the urinals, and I overheard them talking about you, Doctor, in the in the men's room, and they were saying they're going to get you, Doctor. They're going to make you do another journal, and so you better be on your toes, Doctor. And that's exactly what I was on. And I don't think anyone in that room but me uh, knew that I had done my research. I'd known exactly what they were about to do. The uh, the uh, the medical association, very far to the right, was beginning to make uh, look toward making deals with the government. Uh, with the, excuse me, with the uh, Liberal Party, which was the conservative uh, uh, party. And they were high in the popularity polls. They would take over, it would seem, um, excuse me, they were running the government, and uh, they um, were trying to, uh, to create these privatization deals before they left government. They were clearly, they were going to lose the next election. Uh, and indeed, one of the publishing board members came to me several times and tried to get me not to resign by claiming labor was about to take over and that he personally supported labor and that they would be much more liberal in their philosophy and be much more convivial toward the Medical Journal of Australia. Uh, but um, the liberal government uh, wanted to make a deal with the Amer- Australian Medical Association to take over the Australian prescriber as a privatization deal, and the Australian Medical Association would, would pay the government some money. And uh, that's just the kind of activity that they were doing, but I would have none of it. Uh, so it ended um, with my resignation, and uh, I prepared an annual report with the help of a wonderful attorney, my secret weapon, uh, Chris Hood, a recent graduate of the University of New South Wales. And um, I had a wonderful medical writer, Calvin Miller, who I had hired out of a local newspaper in the boondocks of of New South Wales, who had been an American, who was an expatriate, who met a wonderful girl in Australia and remained, and got his PhD, and then became a medical writer, and who, after I left, supported me in a letter to the Lancet, and whereupon he was promptly fired. 
But I did agree with them that uh, the issue on smoking, the theme issue that I was preparing, would be published. Otherwise, I would not leave. And they agreed to that, and Calvin became the person who saw it through. And that became the first issue of any medical journal in, Austri- in, in, in the world devoted entirely to consideration of the world tobacco pandemic. It was also the only issue that uh, came out on March 15th, uh, 2013, uh, March 15th, 1983, while I was editing the, the New York State Journal of Medicine, became the only issue ever to go into a second printing and was widely uh, rec- well received in Australia. So I left in, in, in many ways before the best of my work appeared. And then when I returned, uh, um, among other times, seven years later to give a plenary address at the World Conference on Tobacco Health, I was, was extremely well received. And my plenary address was carried over the Australian Broadcasting Company, or the ABC, uh, by uh, the medical journalist Norman Swan and received a lot of letters from, uh, especially from the South Australian Health Commission, from individuals who expressed their appreciation for my contribution to anti-smoking activities in Australia.